Thank you for tuning back in to our summer Bible study series on the three institutions that God has given to us, the institution of family, of government, and church. We're on the second part of this, this study, focusing on government, and this is part two of our, of our government study. And we are continuing to go through the initial questions that help us set the table or frame what we're trying to do when we look at this this wonderful gift. Now, as we go through this section of this study, we're going to be still working on and understanding what we're talking about with regard to government, understanding some big pictures. We also want to spend some time looking at a biblical history of government in the scriptures, as well as look at some of the opportunities and challenges we're facing in our, our nation and across our nation in a number of different ways. Before we dive into part two of this study, uh, let's have a word of prayer. Please join your heart with mine. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of government. And Lord, it's a huge subject, and there's a lot to digest and, and work through, but we trust that your Holy Spirit will guide us in this conversation with one another on Sunday mornings, and guide me as I seek to present a, a synopsis of what we've talked about and may it bless those who tune in as well. And Lord, thank you for, for making us a part of your family. Uh, thank you for all the ways you govern our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit. Now, lead us and guide us in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is a continuation of uh, the question section of this study. And just diving right in, the, the fourth question has to do with what are the three branches of our nation's government. And of course, um, there are three, the executive, which is headed by the president. There's the judicial, where the final say uh, moves to the Supreme Court on matters uh, in terms of legal decisions. And then the legislative branch made up of both the Congress um, and, and the Senate regarding the, you know, the, the making of laws uh, for all kinds of reasons to, to lead and guide us in, in all kinds of ways to, to govern our lives. Now, some would argue that there's actually an, uh, another branch that's, that's, that's more hidden and yet uh, can be very much a part of what government is all about, and that's all of the bureaucracy underneath those three branches of government. Now, certainly there are people who are appointed by elected uh, by our elected uh, leaders, uh, and yet there can be people within the government that are there for an awful long time and uh, create kind of like a a fourth branch of government that's not necessarily managed directly by the citizens of our of our nation. And, and so as we think about each one of these, uh, there is a, a checks and a balances that's supposed to we're supposed to see that that not one uh, branch of government becomes bigger or more bold than the other. And so there are checks and balances with regard to this. And and certainly there's a lot about this this American experiment, this this American system of government that we can be thankful for, and that we can see glimpses of, in in even the scriptures, uh, in terms of how we treat one another, how we view each other, and boy, this harkens back to our constitution as a nation and what we're acknowledging when we acknowledge you know one nation under God. Um, but moving on to question number five. What current governmental issues are alarming you? And um, so, so there were four that were identified, and perhaps I'll I'll acknowledge the four, and then we'll go back around to each. So there were four: the rise of socialism, as showcased by the Democratic presidential candidate. Um, number two, the rise of anarchy, as shown in riots. Uh, three, the fall of truth and integrity. And number four, uh, the expanding government control. Now, we weren't able to get to the fourth one, but we worked on the, the, the three. 
Um, and, and again, the first one was the rise of socialism in, 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 and among some of our political leaders. It's, it's interesting we're hearing the word socialism. Uh, how Bernie Sanders uh, claims to be a socialist. Now, what the, what is socialism? And you know, you know, we, we tossed it around quite a bit. Um, you know, demanding or forcing equal outcomes, making everybody the same. You know, socialist socialism is basically holding things in common. We 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 all own the cow, so to speak. We we all own the land. We all and and certainly when i go out into the to the federal forest i know that this land belongs to the united states citizen uh, and and uh you know because it's it's governmental land and um and and so we see some glimpses of shared ownership and um shared burden that goes along with that ownership and that's why we pay taxes and and that's why we 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 um, do some of the things we do so that we can have uh, good roads and and whatnot, but <clears throat> you know, not to belabor this this concern. I, I want to. I mean, certainly it's an important issue. Are we going to be a democracy or are we going to become uh, socialists? Are we gonna are we going to relinquish our our right to own and have our own property? Are we going to fall into the demands of those who? Who should be treated equally and and have equal outcomes the same? Um, you know, this is a real challenge. Uh, but I want to focus on what some people suggest when they look at the first century church, when when the church was born by the Pentecost miracle, uh, God filling his his disciples with the holy spirit so they can proclaim the mighty works of god in languages up to that moment they could not speak and people could hear about the mighty works of god and and so forth uh, some very interesting things interesting things happened in the church and in acts chapter 2 verse 44 acts chapter 2 verse 44 grab your bible or open it up if you have it there acts 2 and, and beginning at verse 44, and, and I'd like to read this to you. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all, as anyone had needed. So they, they held their their belongings in common and and they gave as people had needs and uh, and then Luke goes on to say so continually dealing with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved so it, it sounds like a very communal, socialistic um, form of government. But keep in mind, these are believers who have been converted by the gospel. And so now the governing agent within them is, is no one less than the Holy Spirit who has gathered them to each other, uh, given them a mind of love and charity and kindness, and, you know, it also gave a confirmation on this church as to having God's blessings. And it would also uh, put the stamp of apostolic authority on the apostles who were in charge of, of, this, of this church. Keep in mind, I mean, think about it. The, the church up to the Pentecost miracle was very institutionalized, was very powerful, in some ways, when you look at the New Testament, it looks like all the people who were tender to their own sin and their own struggles were driven out. It was a church of only the people that thought they were the best. It was uh, not a church of the misfits or a, a church where membership was for sinners only, but rather it was for those who actually did think they were better than others. And so when Jesus comes, he's rejected and he is crucified by both church and state. 
Uh, and when he rises and reveals his, his proof of the resurrection and then ascends to heaven, 10 days later after his ascension, 40 days after his resurrection, uh, pours out the Holy Spirit and the New Testament church is born. And, and it's a, it's a church of, 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 of high class, low class across the spectrum of sociology. And, and in this, we see God putting the stamp of approval on it, saying, here is the church. And what's interesting is not long after this, and we don't know how much time transpires, but, uh, we hear of, of Ananias and Sapphira who, who, you know, wanted to be a part of this benevolence and wanted to show that they cared about the people around them. And so they sold their property. They wanted to give the money to the apostles, but they, they put together a show. They, they made it into a show. They were going to, uh, they were going to hold some of the money back. And, and, and yet they said to the church that we've, this is what we receive for it. And, and they die. And, and Peter says, look, it was within your power to figure this out. And so what's interesting is this, this kind of government, this, this kind of communal socialism where everything was held in common was, 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 was not very long lived. Uh, now, Look, I've been a pastor for uh, 28 years, and and I've served in four congregations, and and I certainly have 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 witnessed a number of people o over those years being kind and bending over backwards, helping out people in need. I mean, a as a congregation, uh, that's that's what brothers and sisters in Christ do. They care for each other. They help each other. I mean, even at St. Paul, we have a, a Christian care fund uh, called Helping Hands, where people give generously to help out fellow members. We even have a benevolence fund that helps people who are in need that are associated with us, but not necessarily members of our fellowship. So I, I can look uh, across the history of my pastoral ministry, and I can I can see a lot of different faces, and I can see a lot of different congregations that 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 gave of themselves for the common good of the community and and even even to the point where you know the membership of of this this congregation for instance St. Paul in Plano, Texas, we own together in common this this building, this property, uh, the Lord's offering, we're figuring out how to manage it and 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 use it in such a way that glorifies God and serves his purposes for us. And so, you know, you can't rule it all out, but this is certainly a kind of government, but it's governed. We are being governed by the Holy Spirit. Something different has happened to us. This isn't a forced kind of socialism. This isn't a let's use other people's stuff until we run out of it and then we won't know what to do kind of structure. And and so it's not it's not it's not accurate to suggest that that what we see in Acts chapter two is 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 socialism in the way that some want to suggest. So moving on to the next one, the rise of anarchy is shown in riots. Now we have the First Amendment right to to lawfully assemble, and and so having a protest to exercise our freedom of speech are certainly civil rights. These are guaranteed to us by the Constitution, and we have the right to do this kind of stuff. But when a, a protest is, is co-opted by bad actors that want to riot or use it for license to, to be lawless, to steal, to hurt others, then that's just, that's just illegal activity. Uh, no one has the right to do that, and that's unlawful. The challenge is that it, it looks as if this lawlessness um, is is actually being overlooked by those who are supposed to be serving on our behalf for the common welfare of our citizenship, whether it be in a in a community or in a state, in a nation. And so, it's a challenge for us to to look at government that appears to turn a blind eye or show favoritism. Or, or, or become in a way un, ungoverning. 
And, and so this is a real concern that we'll be addressing as we work into this. Again, we're trying to set the table to have kind of a, a, a shared picture of what's happening in, in, a, you know, in our government. And all we can do is look at our own nation and the kind of government we have. Uh, but that's the place to start. It'll also help us to see what's going on around us in the world that we live in as well. Um, the, the, the next was uh, the, the third concern that was raised um, had to do with um, the fall of truth and integrity. In other words, you know, why does it seem like it's hard to believe anybody? Why does, why do I wonder what's, you know, what, what am I not hearing? And when's the other shoe going to drop? And, you know, those kind of comments, you know, um, uh, you know, it, it's almost as if we're living in a time where many don't even see right or wrong. It's just that if you're on the right side of something, you're right, even if it looks wrong. And if you're on the right side of something and, and it's not accepted as right, you're wrong. And things are upside down and, and inside out and all tossed about. So, uh, what's going on with this? And, and, um, you know, the, the, the question was raised, uh, in, in our study on Sunday, you know, who said God is dead? And it's Frederick Nietzsche. And, and, you know, there was a time after the Reformation called the, the Age of Enlightenment. And it, it was basically carried out, um, you know, in, in the 18th and 19th centuries, uh, the 1700s and 1800s, 1800, it came to an end. Um, but, but this idea of placing reason over God, reason over scripture. In other words, I and my intellect can figure things out. And there were a lot of philosophers that really spent a lot of time thinking about and, and working through uh, philosophy in this age of enlightenment. And unfortunately, when, when the age of enlightenment came, then to think of someone who is superior or has authority over um, is, is not a very acceptable thing. And so uh, Nietzsche, you know, argued that because we've come to the age of reason and we can scientifically figure things out, then it pretty much rules out the existence of God. And with the ruling out of existence of God, then there is no ultimate governor. There is no ultimate government. And so everyone can be his own kind of governor and have his own kind of government or get together with a few others and share the same idea. So, you know, the, the challenge that we're seeing right now is, is perhaps even if it was in the enlightenment that many dethroned God, what we're seeing now is, is the cascading trauma of that. And, um, we, we got to the end of our time Sunday. Uh, just kind of laying out what's happening in a, in a big global picture. And uh, maybe what I'll do is I'll fold this little sheet of paper and hopefully make it a little bit more readable. And um, so, so if, so if right now we're in a time where there are two big, narratives, um, big world views with all kinds of different lenses in them, um, competing. I, I would argue that they're actually kind of colliding into each other. So ever since the Christian faith was declared legal and the edict of Milan and, and, um, Constantine became a Christian, the, the Roman um, Empire said, "Well, Christianity can be can be tolerated." Um, a a whole a whole many years, hundreds of years, um, were were shaped by the biblical narrative and the various biblical lenses that govern the way people think about life and whatnot. Um, but in time, then. And there would always be some, some, some pushback and, and you could see cultures not wanting to do that. And certainly when we look at the history of the cultures, the nations around the world, 
there are a number of nations that have no biblical set of lenses at all. They, they have different lenses totally. But in the Western world, the world that we're a part of, our biblical narrative has been losing traction to what I call a, a libertine or liberal secular humanism kind of set of lenses. And so those, those lenses, while the biblical narrative starts losing traction and the secular humanistic starts gaining traction, we're going to start to see some signs of that. And so in this little, um, in this little model that I've given to you, I want you to, if you've been able to print it out, you can just look at it. But, um, you know, on this little sheet of paper, so I have what, what, what I call, you know, the, this, 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 this biblical narrative, these sets of lenses that have helped us frame and understand the way life is and how we operate and function with each other. But then on the other side, there's, there's this, this, you know, this, this, um, secular humanism that is really bringing totally new things to the table. And, and it's not like this is something new. Uh, some big things started taking place, um, in the sixties with the heterosexual revolution. And then we saw the legalization of abortion, no fault divorce. And it seems like you know, the family is a fundamental building block of a culture, of a society started to become undermined. And, uh, you know, so, so the challenge is, you know, how do we pray about these, these powerful forces that are at work and, and right now that are really uh, starting to maybe tear at the fiber of government in all kinds of different ways. How, how uh, differently um, people in the same home can look at the way and the role of government. I, I'm convinced that we have all kinds of powerful civic lessons to learn. And, and I think, you know, boy, it, it's painful. It, it, it pains me to see some of the scenes of the riots on TV or to hear how differently our politicians are looking at things and, and you can tell they're, they're really looking at things from totally different lenses and mindsets and what that does. And, you know, the interesting thing that, that I think about is I have a friend who's, whose dad was murdered in a coup in a different nation. And, um, it was a long time ago. And so they, they, uh, they, they fleed to the United States in, in the seventies. And, and were given, um, um, given protection. And, and I talked with one of his friends who lives in this area of North Texas. And, and, um, I asked him, you know, in the last 150 years, how many times have you seen your nation go through redevelopment? And he said about six times. I mean, he just said it right away. Didn't even hardly have to think about it. I mean, this is painful stuff. So some, some countries just, uh, just seem to be always in anarchy where whoever's in charge can, can, can be in charge for a while and then loses power because of the abuse of power and whatnot. I mean, we have a lot to be thankful for as a nation. Certainly there are challenges that, that are, are becoming more and more painful and more obvious that we need to pray about because the solution is, is not in what we can do for ourselves. It's in God's mercy for us. So as, as, we, as we continue this study, please tune in and uh, join us on Sunday morning if you're able to. We're up in the fellowship hall and it's a bigger space so that there can be uh, social distancing. And the good news in our congregation, we don't have anybody who's had COVID. And, uh, and so, um, you know, uh, thank the Lord, uh, answer to prayers. But uh, I think right now, we need to close this study thinking about these huge forces that are at play right now in real time, every day, in, in and among us and throughout our culture. Let's ask God for mercy. Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of our, our nation and, and the government we have and, and all the different ways that it is to serve us and we are to serve it and, and work together. Have mercy upon us. For Christ's sake, don't treat us as our sins deserve, but forgive and, and, and heal our nation to your glory. Oh God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
and for the blessing of the legacy that will will inherit um, this this wonderful nation and and way of life in our in our in our world. In Jesus' name, Amen. Thanks for tuning in. God bless you.